It's a high resolution film format founded in 1967 that looks very, very good. I mean, that's probably the most basic way I could put it, but really what else is there? Well, a lot. In Wednesday's video, I looked at how Hoyt van Hoytema shot Tenet, and it was actually the first time I was analysing a film shot on IMAX cameras, but now I want to look at what IMAX actually is, because we see it everywhere at the moment, but is it anything other than bigger screen? Before we start, I just want to mention that I really wanted to do this video in a 1.43 to 1 ratio, but as it's nearly impossible to find real 1.43 to 1 footage from films, I'm just going to do it in a 1.90 to 1 and you'll be able to tell when you see a real IMAX shot. In today's video, I look at the history of IMAX, their special cameras and film stocks, as well as what makes it better than generic film, if it even is better. So where does the most famous film format originate? Well, all the way back in 1967, several experimental filmmakers wanted to produce a multi-screen film installation at Expo 67. They did so by syncing nine projectors together, and whilst they pulled it off, they wondered if there was a better way. There was, and over the next few years they had built a camera, projector and theatre, all being shown at Expo 70. This was where they showcased the first IMAX film ever made, and it was called Tiger Child. It was a 17 minute long movie, showcasing locations around the world. For the following years, the films made on IMAX were all documentaries. Sure they looked incredible, but now it was time to take on live action films. A few short films were made, some animated and some live action, but then in 2000, Disney came out with Fantasia 2000, the first feature length film partially made using IMAX film. To bring more mainstream attention to IMAX, they used Digital Media Remastering Technology, or DMR for short. This would convert conventional 35mm films into IMAX, with one of the first films to do so being Apollo 13. This was met with general appraise from reviewers and audiences, but some filmmakers weren't a fan as it wasn't comparable to films shot directly onto 70mm 15 perf IMAX film. Now if we fast forward to 2018, they can now shoot feature length films in IMAX, all thanks to Ari and IMAX producing a camera together, however these weren't shot on film. So there's a difference between films shot on IMAX film and films filmed on digital IMAX cameras, as they have a line of certified IMAX cameras that's not made by IMAX, such as the Arri Alexa 65, Arri Alexa LF and Mini LF, Panavision Millennium DXL2, Red Ranger Monstro and the Sony Venice. I mean, if we just look through this list of films shot partially with 70mm IMAX cameras, we can see that it's actually very small, and we're getting films released in IMAX pretty much every month. For example, Interstellar, The Tree of Life and No Time to Die were all partially shot using IMAX film on those huge cameras that Nolan has broken several of. Then there are films such as Avengers Infinity War and Endgame, shot on the Arri Alexa IMAX, which can be shown in IMAX digital theatres as they were shot in an IMAX format but not on IMAX film. The most notable difference to the average viewer between the two though is the fact that IMAX film is still taller than IMAX digital, with film having a 1.43 to 1 ratio and digital having a 1.90 to 1 ratio. It's still taller than usual, but in comparison to IMAX film, it's still pretty much widescreen. Hopefully that's all made sense. To talk more about the real IMAX film cameras though, we need to start off by talking about the film they use. It's a 70mm format, but kind of similar to 65mm and it's often paired with it, but the usual 65mm film runs vertically, like almost every other film stock out there, except VistaVision and IMAX. The major difference between the normal 65mm stock and IMAX 70mm stock however is that IMAX prints every photogram on 15 perforations as opposed to 5, and that's an absolutely huge difference. A couple of other differences are the fact that you have to have someone from IMAX as a technical assistant. Then you have the aspect of each roll of 1000 feet is just 3 minutes of film. Then the reload of the camera takes about 20-30 to 30 minutes. 
Oh, and they are also extremely loud, so it's almost impossible to shoot dialogue scenes with them. I mean, Nolan tried with The Dark Knight Rises, but it was simply too noisy. But you can't shoot the same way also from a composition point of view. Indeed, when you shoot IMAX, the final image is so massive that you must keep the action centred in your frame, or you take the risk to lose your viewer's attention. If you don't have the money to shoot large format IMAX at the moment, the cheapest way to get into it is by using Blackmagic's Ursa Mini Pro 12K, as whilst it isn't certified by IMAX, it can still be used for large format shooting. But what, if anything, makes IMAX better than generic film? Now obviously the format has to be right for the story. I mean, I can't imagine watching something like The Social Network in a huge 1.43 to 1 ratio. Something like Interstellar on the other hand, I could and have easily watched in it, as it just makes it feel so much more immersive. Which is my first point, when you are watching an IMAX film in theatres, it's physically too big to take your eyes off the screen, which whilst it makes some people feel sick, I can't get enough of. There is a sort of look that goes into IMAX as well. Now, due to the huge frame, you kind of minimalise how you can compose a shot. Too high and it will be cut off when the film has a home release, too far to the left or right, and when you cut on action, the audience could break their neck. As I mentioned earlier, it's advised to keep the actors in the centre of the frame, which whilst it could be a drawback to shooting on IMAX, it also just leaves you in awe. Let's be honest though, the reason we recognise IMAX photography is due to the shooting style that comes along with it, if we are at home and not in theatres. The handheld use of it that Nolan and Fist have popularised has become almost iconic, and so has the style of framing and perspective. I've also realised whilst researching for this video that cameras are often a lot close to us when in IMAX. Now I don't really know why this is, but again it just adds to the overall look. It isn't my place to say what's better, IMAX or normal 35 or 65mm, so what do you think? Let me know down below. I've been working with the IMAX format for years now, and it has this extraordinary strength and power in terms of how deeply it can take the audience into the story. I ordered my hot sauce an hour ago. IMAX is simply the most impressive format for shooting films. Probably the most impractical, but impressive. It not only immerses you in the image more than any other format can, but it has such a rich and interesting history. I can only imagine that shooting on it is one of the highlights of every DP's career, and I hope one day I can shoot at least one reel. Now this was a very condensed look at IMAX and what goes into the IMAX image. I did only use facts from reliable sources, but I've never shot an IMAX for obvious reasons. So if I did miss anything of importance, leave a comment down below and I'll update the description. I hope you enjoyed this video looking at what is IMAX. If you are enjoying these Sunday videos, let me know below and let me know if you have any ideas for videos that you would like to see in the future. If you found this video helpful, a like is appreciated, and if you would like to see more videos like this then hit the subscribe button. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.